we are hopefully <laughs> both going to go see Randy Feltface yes. at the end of January. He's coming towards Raleigh, and we want to clip something from here to put up on YouTube to use his bargaining tools to try and meet him. Hey, that would be awesome. Yeah. I would love to meet a real-life Muppet. Real-life Muppet, even though I don't know how possible it'll be, but... I don't know if King Boom shot. is going to be there or not. Nah. If King Boom is not going to be there, the only second second Muppet we would meet is this. Randy Feltface. And we're checking out his full Purple Privilege show. It's for free on YouTube, so that bodes well for us. Yes. I'm here for it. You ready to go? Man, I'm ready. I All need right. some comedy right now, man. I believe it. You and me both. Three, two, one. It's 2018. I'm in New York City. Midway through an eight-week off-Broadway season of my show, Randy Writes a Novel. The soon-to-be-pirated YouTube sensation. <laughs> eight weeks... He's calling us out! <laughs> ah, I love that. Shots fired. But hey, shots... Hey, hey well, well aimed. Yeah, yeah. All the reactors looking at Randy buys a bookshelf off Gumtree. Hey, hey, I love that. I love that. Hey, you know what I mean? Hey, that's we're it's a symbiotic relationship, man. Mm -hmm. It's a symbiotic relationship. Can't yeah. bitch at us. You making the money anyway, bro. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> plus, it put two butts in your seats for your Raleigh dates next year. So can't talk too much shit. Nope. Mm -hmm. I love that though, right out the gate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's I, that was so cold. I was like, why is he looking at me? Like, God damn it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, here we go. Weeks in New York should be a dream, right? Pinnacle of my goddamn career. But I feel like I'm doing the wrong show in the wrong theatre, and every night I grab my audience by the scruff of the neck and drag them unwillingly through my own existential nightmare. <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever met anyone from New York City, but they don't tend to patiently endure the bullshit of others. <laughs> I once had a homeless man in New York tell me to hurry the fuck up while I was handing him a dollar bill. <laughs> so it's not going great. For added context, the show isn't the only horse meat currently feeding my black dog. Before I came out here, I split with my management company. I have no work lined up after this season. And last week, my girlfriend flew out here from Australia to break up with me in oh. person. No. Oh! Yeah, I would have been fine with a phone call, but apparently it's much easier to kick a man while he's down if you're in the same fucking room. So, <laughs> she made the trick! <laughs> This morning, I met a friend for brunch at a cafe in Greenwich Village that only serves oatmeal. The cafe is called Oatmeals. <laughs> it's very good. My friend is also an Australian comedian performing here in New York City, and she's had her fair share of depressing career moments. So I was hoping for a little bit of sad sack solidarity. Unfortunately for me, Hannah Gadsby is having the breakout season of her career. Oh. I, on the other hand, had 32 people in my Sunday matinee today and 21 of them walked out during the show. Oh. 21. Not all at once either. Just a few at a time <laughs> in a steady, humiliating trickle. Like people having their number called out in a fucking dally. <laughs> it was the nonchalant disrespect that really broke me. About halfway through the show, an elderly woman in the front row started clipping her fingernails. Oh my god. We could all hear it. She did both hands, thumbs inclusive, then slowly got up, put her coat on and left. <laughs> She clipped her fingernails and then left. Do you understand what that means? <laughs> My show was less important to this woman than the speed at which her fingernails were growing. <laughs> 
10 fingernail clippings out of 10 is easily the worst review I've ever had. <laughs> After the show, my theatre staff told me that she said she left because she thought there was too much swearing in the show. I mean, to be fair, I did call her a cunt. But... <laughs> show I step out of the theatre, turn right and walk 23 minutes down West 42nd Street to Grand Central Station. I purchase a ticket for the first train going north, which is a Hudson Line train to Poughkeepsie for those playing at home. I board the train, remove my jacket, take my seat and vow to never ever ever do comedy ever again. <laughs> <laughs> Funny how that worked out. Yep. Opening song, that's what this is. <laughs> you thought it was a comedy, now it's a musical. What the fuck is this? I was over there. <laughs> now I'm right here. I've changed my clothes to signify that it's a different year. Cause this show happens over multiple timelines Timelines Like a Tarantino film without the graphic homicides <laughs> And far fewer foot fetish moments <laughs> Except for this one <laughs> Check them out boys Opening song Written by me A singing, dancing piece of shit That you all paid to see You got it wrong Cabaret <laughs> Sucked in bad if you thought this would make a good first date <laughs> Cause this show is my goddamn magnum opus Opus You made the choice to be here so you better fucking focus <laughs> And if you'd rather be at home with married at first sight You get the hell out There'll be no refunds Terms and conditions Come on! When purchasing a ticket, always review the event and seat selection. No exchange or refund for misplaced tickets or show content objections. Subject to no conditions, consumer provisions, price including taxes. No bad attack at the back and out, you're on crack if you drastically underestimate the power of the written code of practice. Hey. It's a purple Gen X cis man with an income and a platform. Statistically, I'm more likely to instigate a shitstorm. But I'm also much more likely to escape without reproach. The system is still stacked my way. That's why I think I can get away with an opening song. Opening song. That's what this is. Has a key change that's a little hit or miss. Opening song, <laughs> right in your face. I couldn't give a flying fuck about my own fan base. I just wanted to sing an opening song. Fuck you. <laughs> oh, oh, he's got some pipes, that's for sure. Hey, man. Hey. Yeah. I, dude, that's that's one of the best songs. Uh, that's how do you how do you open a show with an opening song? So what's it gonna be? Opening song. Brilliant. Yeah, run yeah. with it. Run with it. Mm hmm. He's got a good voice. Not gonna lie. Hey, He's decent. You know. Yeah. Yep. But that and yeah, that key change was definitely a miss on that I, one. I I loved it because I want to remember that travesty. So it worked. Yeah, it's an earworm. It's an earworm. Oh, funny song. <laughs> it's cabaret. Oh, dude, I love this man. Yeah. I love this man. I wonder. I wonder how much. Like it just. It's a different world once once he becomes the puppet. Yeah, it's just yeah. it must open all the doors. Like for real, you're untouchable. It's a puppet. Right. Yeah. People don't know your face. Yeah, it's a fucking puppet you're gonna get mad at a puppet no you're the puppet if you get mad yeah. at a puppet yeah exactly you know? <laughs> yeah yeah thank you thank you my privilege is your pleasure thank you please take photographs thank you thank you so much my comedy actually works best in photographs check it out <laughs> <laughs> 
I could be saying anything. You're all a bunch of fuckheads. <laughs> I'm gonna burn this shithole to the ground and move to the Gold Coast. <laughs> Never judge a comedian by their photograph, my friends. Unless they're doing this on a billboard. Mm, 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 mm. Judge the fuck out of them if they're making those particular creative decisions. But if you what are you talking about? I'm not making any bad creative decisions at all. Mm. And we're not not sponsored, guys. Not affiliated. Mm. Not yet. <sighs> not yet. If you want realistic shots of a comedy show, you have to take photos of the audience. That's what I'd prefer to see, to be honest. When I'm home after a gig, doom scrolling in the pitch darkness. <laughs> just shots of my audience just doing this. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't the Queen's Gambit. Ah! Oh, you sound like a good crowd. You sound like a real good crowd tonight. Very excited about this. Look at you all, you bloody champions coming out, wearing your masks. Good on you. Why do you love it? Mm -hmm. Actually, just out of interest, Sid Noon, um, give me a shout if you've never seen me in real life before. Make some noise. Fascinating. <laughs> Laboratory tests have shown <laughs> that humans, when meeting another human for the first time, automatically encode three key nuggets of information. Age, race, gender. So... <laughs> What's going on here? Encode this shit, newcomers. I think the fourth nugget of information we encode is what is wrong with you? You know, like it goes like age, race, gender. What happened to your face? <laughs> and sometimes people make it too easy for you to judge them. People with Southern Cross tattoos or people who vape. Oh. <laughs> People who wear shorts, no socks, sunglasses, and a puffer jacket. You're either hot or you're cold, mate. You can't have both. <laughs> Always wandering around judging people all of the time. I don't give money to homeless people because they spend it on drugs, she said, washing a Xanax down with a coffee on her way to a Botox appointment. <laughs> it's a tricky time, my friends. It's a real tricky time. Tricky, tricky judge of time. We're living in a real tricky judge of time right now. Right now, Sydney. Tricky judge of time. What is it? It's fucking tricky. Oh, tricky judge of time out there. Tricky. It's a tricky time. We're oh, living in a tricky time. Right now. Hmm. Hmm. Right now. It's a tricky time. Oh, what the oh, fuck? Yeah, tricky, tricky time. <laughs> Tricky, tricky time. <laughs> Hello there, what's your name? Am I looking right down the fucking aisle? I am. Uh, fuck! <laughs> fuck! <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Bullshit. Hello there. You... Have, have the house lights just come on? That's fucking great. Trev's just turned the house lights on. Like, that's going to make a difference. <laughs> that's awesome. I'll just turn those on. He'll see them then, won't he? <laughs> that was perfect. <laughs> I, I love that. <clears throat> oh. I'm sure that's not the first time he's done that. <laughs> what's your What's your name? There's no fucking answer. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Am I looking right down an aisle right now? <laughs> like, fuck! fuck. <laughs> oh, shit. There's something about seeing a Muppet. Yeah. Just cuss. Yeah, it's, it's, it's just wholesome. Yeah, it's like it harkens back to like parodies on like Mad TV or, yeah. uh, you know, other things like that, you know? Dude, this is, this is everything. This comedian is everything to me, man. Yeah. <laughs> oh. How about a hand for my text, Trev? What a champion. Good <laughs> for Zach on the sound. Yes. Okay, let's try take two on that. Hello there, what's your name? Zane. What? 
Zane. Zane with the Z. Yep. Hello, Zane. How are you, matey? Yeah, I'm all right. What did you do today, Zane? Not much. Not much? Give me something to fucking work with, Zane. <laughs> <laughs> Anything at all, my friend. Did you catch a bus? Did you put your pants on? Help me out, brother. <laughs> what happened? Caught the train here. You what? Caught the train here. You caught the train here. See, there's something to work with. Zane's now given me a comedic premise. <laughs> talk about trains, I can talk about the fact that he's got nothing else to do other than catch a train. <laughs> you can deconstruct Zane's sad little life. Let's go back to Zane. Zaney! Woo! <laughs> so where did you catch the train from, Zane? Where do you live, champ? Um, Cronulla. Cronulla! Yeah. Someone went, eh. <laughs> that was the best. I believe that is the international sound for Cronulla. Eh. <laughs> That's how you call out each other in a crowd. Uh, don't don't sit up front at a Randy Fell face show. <laughs> oh god, I love that. I, oh, I love this. It's like it's it is crowd work, but it's innocent. But absolutely hilarious crowd work. Yeah. He, he's not <sighs> taking any prisoners right now. Oh, <sighs> Good on you, Zane. You're a champ. Hey, Zane, unrelated question. Roll with me on this. Just go with me. Bit of improv. How old do you think I am, Zane? How old do you reckon I am? And just have a little guess. How old do you think little <laughs> me think Randy is? How old, Zane? Yeah, 20. 20? Oh, my God. Thank you. <laughs> Double it! I'm 40, Zane! 40 years of age! It's a good age, 40, I love it. 40's the new 36! <laughs> Unless, of course, like me, you're single with no children, no mortgage, and no responsibilities whatsoever, then 40's the new 27! <laughs> Casual sex and psychedelics are wasted on the young. <laughs> Actually reminds me, um, this is a good segue, I've, I'm trying to tap into the youths, um, so I've started my own podcast, finally, putting out a podcast. People have been asking for ages, Randy, when are you doing a poot coup? So I'm doing one, um, I was going to do one of those ones where comedians talk to other comedians about comedy, but I thought, you know what, that's almost too original. So what I'm doing now <laughs> is a, a bit of a self-help kind of podcast. Do you all want to hear a sample? Yes. It's called The 40-Year-Old Fuckboy. Fuck boy. Fuck you. Fuck boy. Welcome back to the 40 year old fuck boy. Is it a Wait. midlife crisis or a second? Why, why, why? How old is this clip? Uh, let's see. Uh, when did this come out? Uh, bah, 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 bah. two years ago, November 2021. What are you actually looking up to see if this is a real podcast? No, no, hold on. Hold on, one sec. No, there's, there's something, there's something that I need to, I need to, hold on, hold on a sec. Just, okay. hold on, just bear with me, bear with me. This is, this is. Hold on, because this is relevant. There's a YouTuber I follow. Let me see. His name is Black Pegasus. It is called, his channel is called Black Pegasus. But guess what? Guess what? What? His his podcast is called 40-Year-Old Fuckboys. <laughs> I wow. just... Boom. <laughs> and that's how I was like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That is interesting. Okay, I'm back on the train. Okay. The train. All right, let's back up this podcast episode. What? Again. It's called The 40 Year Old Fuck Boy. Fuck you, fuck boy. 
Welcome back to the 40-year-old fuckboy. Is it a midlife crisis or a second Saturn return? Who knows? Today on the show, I'm going to be teaching you all how to overcompensate for that pesky childhood trauma by telling a woman you love her on a first date. <laughs> but first, let's open Randy's fuckboy mailbag. Randy's fuckboy mailbag. <laughs> for people who used to write letters. <laughs> Today's letter comes to us from Trent from Glebe. Trent writes, I'm a 40-year-old rock-climbing yoga instructor with a top knot who always wears loose trousers to really accentuate my dick flopping around. <laughs> Until recently, my speciality was luring 36-year-old women from my yoga classes to join me for private tantra workshops, but now I can't stop masturbating to trans porn. <laughs> Should I get a Kelpie? A what? <clears throat> well, uh... Sounds like you really miss your mum, Trent. Um... What? You should definitely get a Kelpie. Sheepdogs fucking thrive in the inner city. Coming up after the break on The 40-Year-Old Fuckboy, we're going to be talking to Joe Rogan about the relationship between psychedelic enlightenment and kicking cunts in the head. 40-Year-Old <laughs> Get it wherever you get your podcasts. Now, I know what you're thinking, Sydney. You're thinking, Randy, you're a 40-year-old single mother successful comedian with ants in his car. <laughs> you didn't need to know Seriously, that. I have ants in my car. I don't know what to do about it. They form like their own society in the air vents. As a vegan, I feel bad killing them, but... What kind of man has ants in his car? <laughs> <laughs> Randy, tell us, what series of fucked up, unfortunate events led for you to turn out like this? Please, skip over any major trauma and give us a light-hearted look into your undoubtedly sordid backstory. Well, I tell you what, Zane, if nothing else, that sounds like a great way to kill 47 minutes of this fucking show. So here, for the first time in Sydney Town, I'm going to take you all back to where it all began. Back story. <laughs> I was born on the day Lindy Chamberlain's baby was eaten by a dingo. <laughs> it was August in the year of our Lord 1980. God save the Queen. <laughs> That's the most Aussie thing I've ever heard. I was born on the day the dingo ate the baby. Uh, I love that. I always, anytime someone says that, I think of that Tropic Thunder. Like, hey, don't joke about that. That's a true story. That really happened. It's tragic. <laughs> uh, oh, my God. Oh, God. 1980. God Save the Queen was still Australia's national anthem. We were nine years away from joining the global internet and Me Too was a phrase most often used in response to the statement, I think women belong in the kitchen. <laughs> My earliest childhood memories are a colourful montage of drunk adults eating corn on the cob while staring into the middle distance. <laughs> The sound of cockatoos ricocheting off red brick houses. The innocence of youth shrouded in thick clouds of second-hand cigarette smoke. <laughs> at the tender age of five, I arrived at St Mary's Catholic Primary School, where I met my new best friend, Jesus Christ! <laughs> if you're unfamiliar with his work, he pissed off the wrong people in Israel a couple of thousand years ago. So now we have Christmas and and hell, <laughs> which, uh, which, depending on your family, can be the same thing. Am I right? <laughs> I'm doing relatable material to find common ground with my audience. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Oh, man. Uh, what got me was him going, ah! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. So you're just uh, going to break down all of comedy. Got it. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh... <sighs> At age seven, I made my first Holy Communion, where I ate of the body of my new best friend, Jesus Christ, who I'd been reliably informed was brutally murdered because I had been naughty before I was born. <laughs> you see, only the Catholics laugh at that. Everyone else is like, that can't be right. It is! <laughs> That's how they get you! <laughs> Immediately following my first Holy Communion, I had my first menthol cigarette. Mmm, menthol cigarettes. There's a burning tube of toothpaste in my lungs and everyone's invited. <laughs> Catholicism taught me the difference between right and wrong and left no doubt in my mind that right was boring and wrong was Fucking hilarious. <laughs> My proudest childhood achievement is the fact that I was the first kid in the 100-year history of St Mary's Catholic Primary School to receive an after-school detention. <laughs> Literally moments after after-school detentions were first introduced. <laughs> the vice principal, Mr Burke, he pulled all of the students together for this very stern lecture about discipline and the fact that these after-school detentions would act as a deterrent for disrespectful behaviour. And at the end of his very stern lecture, in the silence that followed, I gave him a slow clap. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave me a detention. What? And once I realised that the dopamine hit attached to being a smart ass far outweighed any of the repercussions, <laughs> There was no turning back. OK, grade ones. Bit of shush, please. Our next oral presentation is from Randy Feltface, who will be reading his oral presentation on this year's Bicentennial of Australia. Look at him. Oh, he's tiny. Yeah, he's like uh it's like Sesame Street now. Yeah, yeah, pretty pretty much. Yeah. It's, it's a, he's a he's a he's a complete Muppet right now. Yeah, yeah. Oh god. I just have a feeling this ain't gonna this is gonna get good. Oh, it's gonna man. be good. Thank you, it's great to be here, grade ones. Um how about a hand for everybody's favourite nun, Sister Dimpner? <laughs> um, uh, uh, Sister Dimpner's uniform is looking a little scruffy today. I guess it's just one of her bad habits. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, apparently, Sister Dimpner walks 20 miles before school every morning. I guess that's why they call her a Roman Catholic. <laughs> I've got lots of these grade ones. Please get on board. <laughs> this year is 1988, which is the bicentenary of Australia. Knock, knock. Yeah. Colin. Colin. Colonisation. <laughs> <laughs> Only joking. Colonizers don't knock before they come in. Laughs in American. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> oh, Love that. God. Woo! All right. <laughs> All right. Aboriginal people had lived in Australia for thousands of years before it was discovered by Portuguese sailors in the 1500s. Then it was discovered by Dutch explorers in the 1600s. Then it was discovered by Captain Cook in 1770. I don't know how a place can be discovered if there are already people living there, but I still use Velcro shoelaces, so what would I know? <laughs> Which reminds me, what is Australian history's most famous ship? 
censorship. <laughs> Cutting edge material for the late eighties. <laughs> On the 26th of January, 1788, <laughs> Captain Arthur Phillip hosted the first ever barbecue for him and his crew and the 850 criminals he brought with him. We don't celebrate it as a national holiday yet, but those colourful criminals with their rich tapestry of fantastic backstories would go on to be the founders of a surprisingly boring society. <laughs> Which reminds me, why did the insomniac get sent to the Australian penal colony? Why? They were resisting arrest. <laughs> huh? Insomni... Re I'm only seven, Jesus. <laughs> now... I love how we're learning Australian history, too. Wasn't yeah. expecting that shit. Right. Oh man, that's the best kind of show, man. When you take what when you bring out when you take out knowledge, like what? yeah, right, right. Oh man, maybe this is more reason to start that Australian yes. spinoff. Embrace the Oz Twenty One. Hey, yes, one hundred percent. Yeah, link may or may not be in the description, by the way. Now it is 200 years later. There are 16 million people living in Australia. Bob Hawke is our Prime Minister, and you can buy a three bedroom house in Sydney for $90,000. Yeah, just let that sink in for a second. Wow. To celebrate the bicentennial, Brisbane is hosting Expo 88, which will no doubt be the most interesting thing to happen in Brisbane for the next 200 years. <laughs> In summary, sovereignty was never ceded, but sausages are on special. Thank you. I'll see you all at the monkey bars after the show. <laughs> if you are Yeah, that's not too bad of a presentation. I'd give that kid an A. Hey, 100% for a, for a kid? Oh yeah. Knocked it out of the park. Yeah. Yeah, not too bad at all. Yeah. Not too bad at all. If you are a parent of young children, chances are you have already done or said the thing that will be the direct cause of your child's worst adult moment. <laughs> and the best part is they won't even realize it's your fault. <laughs> But you'll know. <laughs> you'll be sitting there at the back of the courtroom, just shamefully watching the cross-examination. So tell us again in your own words, Zane, you took a shit... <laughs> you took a shit in a mailbox and then punched a police horse? And your mum's at the back of the courtroom going, oh my God, it's because of that time I put curdled milk into his Fruit Loops and still made him eat them. It all makes sense now! <laughs> Difficult being a parent. Don't envy that job. Do not envy it at all, you know? I mean, I grew up in a very loving home. Very loving parents. Never wanted for anything. Happy pants, hyper-coloured t-shirts, Ninja Turtles, Michael Bolton, etc. And, and yet it's very easy to blame your parents for your own dysfunction. Particularly if they're boomers. Oh my God! Here we go. What's to be done with the boomers? <laughs> Too many opinions, not enough computer literacy. <laughs> They're all getting radicalised by Facebook. No more screen time for the boomers! <laughs> Internet's a scary place for the best of us. They're all running around in their sensible polo shirts trying to figure it out. Get them out of there! <laughs> I mean, I find it challenging. I'm sure we all do, you know? You wake up first thing in the morning and someone's like, oh, hey, what's your fully formed opinion on this incredibly complex social issue that you just learned about five minutes ago? <laughs> Quick, type it into your phone so the rest of us can tell you to fuck off and die. <laughs> <laughs> the confidence of people on the internet is truly astonishing. Imagine the self-belief it takes to tell someone you've never met before that you hope they get fucked by a chainsaw. <laughs> I mean, what a consequence-free life you must have led up until that point. The kid that jumped off the roof onto the trampoline and didn't break their arm. Oh my god, you're invincible. I bet one day you could be the Attorney General. <laughs> 
the point where oh, get fucked, Sydney boy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're gonna need context with that one. <laughs> yeah. Oh God. Uh, so no more curdled milk for Alexander, right? No, no, I try not to. I yeah. mean, it, you always have to have a little bit of curdle in there, just yeah. so he can appreciate good milk. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't know what uh, you got until it's gone. I, I, I keep. <laughs> I have. What is it? So. Anyway, maybe I'll save this for a later time. Okay. Maybe that's that for a later time. Maybe All afterwards. Right. It's it's. I was looking for like bedtime stories, you know, like nap time stories to tell my son, and we we stumbled on a channel that did like he wanted to know about Bigfoot, uh, and so I was like, oh hey, I'll just let oh. this one play out. Fucking terrified us both. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking ter that story terrified us both, and oh, I'm like, my good God, God, man, he's scarred. I'm just terrified. <laughs> so yeah knocked yeah. it out of the park with that one he'll he'll definitely be back by sunset for dinner right yeah definitely not playing in the woods now that's for mm -mm. damn sure mm -mm. <laughs> outraged at that asset why would she lie get fucked <laughs> we have to never forget that knowledge travels faster than the speed of self-righteousness. <laughs> like, your opinions are kind of worthless if they're unbendable over time, you know? You've got to be willing to change your opinions, learn new information, adapt, fucking keep step with the knowledge. You have to be more like the algorithms that absorb all of your online activity to the point where you just have to think about buying a yoga mat and one smashes through your kitchen window. <laughs> And if you're unhappy, you know, just fucking change. <laughs> wow. If you have the means uh, to change. If you don't have the means to change, that's a terrible situation. I feel awful for you, but you probably do. <laughs> I mean, if you're here, you know, can afford to come and see this shit, you could probably change. Might be the hardest thing you've ever done. Might take ages. But please, for the love of God, if you're unhappy, fucking change. Because <laughs> quite frankly, you being miserable is ruining it for the rest of us. <laughs> Yelling at me in traffic because you married an asshole. Just end your marriage. You're killing the fucking vibe out here. <laughs> Oh, man. As if as if it was that simple. Oh my god, dude. But I say that all the time. It's <laughs> not my fault. You sons of bitches are fucking miserable. Exactly. It's not their fault that they chose to live in Virginia, right? Yeah. It's not my fault. Yeah. Next time don't pick a shit state or crawl back up and get born somewhere else. Like change your destination, change your trajectory. You know, all that, all that, all that motivational stuff applies. Yeah. Yeah. Move, move. And if you can't move. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jeez, I can't wait till we retire so we can hate each other in a camper van instead. <laughs> I've always wanted to yell at you in a camper van. Ugh. Traveling only broadens your horizons if you're open to having your horizons broadened. Otherwise, you're just the same dickhead in a different deck chair. Amen. Oh. It's astonishing how quickly the intensity and density of New York City melts away behind me as the train winds its way along the bank of the Hudson River. Urban grey makes way for forest green, and as the train pulls in at Cold Spring Station, I feel myself starting to wake up for the first time in months. Have you ever washed clothes at the same time as a duvet cover? And then when you take the duvet cover out of the washing machine, all the clothes are somehow inside the duvet cover. And you have to climb in the duvet cover. 
get all wet from the duvet cover just to rescue your little ball of clothes from the bottom corner of the duvet. <laughs> the last few months I feel like I've been stuck inside a duvet cover in a washing machine. And as we pull in at Cold Spring Station, it feels like someone's reached in and yanked me out of the bottom corner of the duvet. <laughs> I wander up the quaint little main street of Cold Spring and my brain is having trouble processing the fact that I was in a cultural melting pot of eight million people an hour and a half ago and now I appear to have stepped onto the set of an episode of Whitey McWhiterson Goes to Whitopia. <laughs> But I catch myself being elitist, and I hate being elitist, so I stop and I say hello to a man who's walking his dog, and he hears my Australian accent and starts telling me that this is the town that Don McLean lived in when he wrote the song American Pie. Oh, wow. Realising that I was right to be elitist, I wish the man a speedy death and continue up the hill. Oh, my God. <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> was that back there? What was that? <laughs> back to the story. I find a hotel, eat a bowl of soup, and fall into a deep sleep. In my dream, I'm eight years old, lying in bed in the spare room at my grandparents' house, listening to pigeons cooing on the windowsill, waiting for everybody else to wake up. My grandmother leans in through the doorway. Good morning, chum. Hi, Nanny. Penny for your thoughts? Oh, I could have done better, you know. I've had everything handed to me and I haven't done anything with it. Well, you can either lie there carrying on like a two-bob watch or you can pull up your britches and get out of your own way. Thanks, Nanny. Right, up your pop. I'll make you some yeast on toast. <laughs> Yum! <laughs> it's still dark when I wake up in Cold Spring and it takes me a good seven minutes to locate the switch for the bedside lamp. I'm constantly baffled by lamp manufacturers who think it's terribly clever to conceal the most important feature of a fucking lamp. <laughs> Without a switch it's just a shit sculpture <laughs> I feel like I'm always rifling around up the skirt of some lamp or another lost track of the number of times I've had to send my hand on a deadly spelunking mission down the back of a motel room bed to trace my way along the lamp cord dodging tumbleweeds of pubic hair and <laughs> navigating a minefield of discarded prophylactics <laughs> Only to find out later you're supposed to knock three times, turn in a circle and provide a stool sample before it turns on! <laughs> Sick of lamps! <laughs> that is the message of this show! <laughs> no more lamps! <coughs> <coughs> oh my god, I'm the missing link. Super spreader. <coughs> <coughs> All this about lamps. I 100% I agree with him. Yeah. I 100% agree with him. Like, there's no standard to lamps. No, no. It's it's like the wild, wild west still yeah. of yeah. lamps. Like, where the fuck is the switch? I don't know. Half the, half the time, the lights in my hotel room are never on anyway. Like, yeah. it's yeah. just like, because it's not by choice. It's because I'm mm -hmm. too lazy to find which switch is which. Mm-hmm. And the amount of hotels I stayed in and I'm going to stay in between 2023 and 2024. Yeah. I hate lamps now. Yep. I, uh, they could go suck at a big one. Yeah. I'm with you on that. So, I mean, this is a pretty valid point that I haven't given enough thought to. Yeah. So yeah. Fuck lamps. Yeah. But then again, he is in a small quaint town in upstate New York, apparently where Don McLean left lived and wrote American pie. So Maybe it's justified that there's not the technology of lamps has not caught up. Probably that that we do have some podunkery out there. Yeah, you know, and and their podunk is usually right right outside the city limits. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> Run! Run! <sighs> Run! 
I get dressed and I step out into the crisp dawn, just as the sky is starting to yellow out in the east. Cool, clean air fills my lungs. And this scene would be picture perfect if I could just get Don McLean's fucking American Pie out of my head. <laughs> A leisurely 15-minute stroll later, and I'm at the entrance to the Hudson Highlands Nature Reserve. I rest my face against the mossy bark of an enormous oak tree, take a moment to synchronise myself with my surroundings. I inhale, step into the forest, and plan never to return. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um... <laughs> I realise, based on the stunning silence that occurred during that blackout, that <laughs> it's a bit stupid having flashbacks from 2018 when you clearly know what happens at the end. <laughs> like, oh my God, what's going to happen? He's going to do a show in Sydney in two years. Surprise! <laughs> Fucking spoiler alert! <laughs> clearly I changed my mind about quitting comedy at some point. And that's all right. It's good. <laughs> it's good to change your mind. I do it all the time. Constantly changing my mind. Changing my opinions. Gotta do it. Gotta change those opinions. Old Randy, fucking changey pants over there. Always changing his fucking mind, isn't he? Hmm? When was the last time you changed your mind? <laughs> Sometimes you've just got to try new things. See what happens. <laughs> For example, I've never done this at this point in the show before. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. <sighs> Gotta try new things. <laughs> change your opinions. Well, give us an example, Randy. Who said that? <laughs> now, all right, I'll give you a fucking example, Sydney. Um, drugs! <laughs> drugs! I don't do drugs. My privileged opinion of drug use is that productivity is more important than escapism. And also, I'm wired in such a way that if I even so much as look at a drug, I will be doing speed off a strip club toilet seat within two to three hours. <laughs> so my opinion is, I should not do drugs. But then I went to Canada. <laughs> Anytime you walk down the street in any Canadian city, you're constantly getting crop dusted with clouds of delicious smelling marijuana smoke because weed is legal there. So people walk around punching blunts like they're at a fucking folk festival. <laughs> I was in Quebec City for two days and I started following pot smokers down the street like a cartoon character floating towards a pie on a windowsill. <laughs> <laughs> So I changed my opinion and decided I should do drugs. <laughs> Is anybody I guess that I guess I know what I'm doing in Toronto in uh, there you go. in April. <laughs> there you go. There you go, man. Goodness. Oh god. Love him. I, I I'll try and you know anyway, I'll, I'll let this one cook. <laughs> yeah. 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 Anybody here actually been to Quebec City? Anyone? It's a beautiful part of the world, isn't it? Bit confusing. French-speaking Canadians ruled by the Queen of England. Pick a fucking lane. Quebec. <laughs> but I was doing shows there, and I was like, I'm not going to seek drugs out, but if somebody offers me drugs, I'll definitely take them. And uh, sure enough, after a show one night, I was approached by some youths. Some youths approached me. And they offered me a brownie. Now, they're very fond of edible drugs in that part of the world. The pot brownie and the hash cookie and the weed cake and the 
wacky tobacco toasted sangy and <laughs> these youths offered me a brownie the size of a fucking John Grisham novel so I said yes <laughs> thank you youths and I took it back to my hotel room and I put on some comfortable trousers put a bit of King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard on Spotify <laughs> and I haven't done drugs for about nine years at this point, so I didn't want to go too hard. So I just broke off a tiny corner of this massive brownie and just had a little... Nip, 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 nip. Just a little... Tiny little... Because I didn't want to go too hard. But then, after like ten minutes, nothing happened. So I ate the whole thing. Oh, no! fast like there were cops at the door I was like huh? oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's like uh, r-rated cookie monster there <laughs> cops at the door oh yeah you never He's... take me alive oh, no, 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 no. oh god I, I love that I'm not gonna be able to get that image out of my head <laughs> rated cookie monster uh, it's like what what happened when he fell on hard times? Just just pot cookies, mm -hmm. just just that's what he does now. Cookie monster. Mm -hmm. oh. Put his cookie dough with a spoon and a lighter. Yep, he's like man, cookies. He's like oh god, <laughs> tough times, tough times out there in the uh, Henson world. Yeah, and that's how the cookie crumbles. Boom. <laughs> Jim Carrey reference for those of you not in the know. <sighs> and um, then I googled how long it normally takes for a pot brownie to kick in. <laughs> Does anybody want to share with the class how long it normally takes for a pot brownie to kick in? Does anybody know? About an hour. Yeah, about an hour. I was like, oh, I'm going to die in this hotel room. <laughs> I started getting my affairs in order, cancelled my subscriptions to Yoga Glow and Chatterbait, started putting a PowerPoint presentation together for my own funeral service. And then, after like 75 minutes, I realised it was just a fucking brownie. <laughs> just a regular old drug-free chocolate brownie. Lovingly prepared by the youths of Canada just to be fucking innocently distributed amongst the tourists. So now my opinion is Canadians are fucking idiots. Uh, only Canada. Oh, dude. Man. I mean, I don't know, man. <laughs> Some Canadians in here. I don't know if we have any Canadians in here, but is that something y'all would do? They're just too nice. Here you go. Here's a here's a brownie. Like what? Yeah. What? Why is it? It has to have drugs. I don't know. Just bring the brownie. Get that out of my face. <laughs> uh, oh, show me where the poutine is and the Canadian whiskey. Right. Pretty much. Pretty much yeah. is what it's about, man. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh. Me again. <laughs> Hello. Am I your favourite part of the show so far? Yeah. I'm very cute, aren't I? I'm also massively racist. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, babies, without exception, prefer faces of their own race. It's just how we come out. It's all like that. And if you're sitting there going, my baby's not racist, I'm talking specifically to you and your goddamn racist baby. <laughs> I suppose up until this point in my life, no one's really given me an alternative to that perspective. Um, you know, everybody from the church to hey, hey, it's Saturday pretty much reinforces the idea that different means worse. Which is probably why I'm also quite homophobic, I think. That one's a real bummer, because um, I'm actually attracted to some of the boys in my class. I've even fooled around with a couple of them, but it's pretty clear that sort of thing is frowned upon. And I'm also attracted to a couple of the girls, so I think I'm just going to put all of my eggs in that basket for now, save myself from the inevitable ridicule, you know. <sighs> I'm still just a little sponge, 
You know, sponge, sponge, sponge. Just taking everything in, spongity, spongity, sponge. Forming my little opinions. Oh, spongity, 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 sponge. You know, people say all sorts of things around me and while I don't expect to be protected from reality, sometimes it'd be good to get an explanation to go along with what I'm witnessing. Words have an impact, you know? And a single word can have a vastly different impact depending on which side of the fence it lands. The word freedom is often used to imprison. The word settlement might mean birthright to an Israeli and unlawful military occupation to a Palestinian. The word gluten might mean limited menu choices for a handful of people and hilarity for the rest of us. <laughs> I suppose I'll either settle for these inherited belief systems when I'm older or actually do a bit of compassionate investigation and consider the alternatives. I don't know. Who knows? Mm. Who knows? <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot to think about, really. It's probably a bit much, to, to be honest. Is that a racist baby? <laughs> 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 timing of that was exquisite. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard being little, isn't it, baby? You know, it's tricky, it's hard. It's a lot of choices to make and it's a lot of pressure, you know? Spongity sponge, you know? <laughs> I mean, I want to be successful when I grow up. I want to make my parents proud, you know? I want to be happy. I want to be a good person. I want, I want like a, a good job. I want a house, a wife, kids. These are things that I'm told make a successful grown-up. I don't want to be one of those adults that has ants in their car. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was deep. That was, that was deep, man. That was good. Mm. That was good. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Uh, a lot to take in as a baby. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, it, it paints a very, you know, I'm coming, I'm coming to the re realization of that picture being 100% uh, truth right now. Like it's about to be on my door. This situation oh. is about to be on my door right now. Oof. You know, so I'm terrified. So we'll see how I get through it. You know? Yeah. So nothing in this world helps you prepare for nope. that. So, nope. and I wonder who came up with that line, by the way. No idea. No idea. <laughs> but thank you, Randy Feltface, yes. for uh, bringing this to hit to Dan's yes, attention. Yes, yes, 100%. It's good. It's good. You know, I, I, there's a time and place for, I feel like, for comedians to, to, to talk about real shit, you know, and mm -hmm. voice their opinions. I know, I, I know Burr. But Burr, what? Bo Burnham does that too in his comedy, and oh, it's yeah. very impactful. Oh, yeah. It's really, it's really good. It's really a beautiful thing when he does that. And just like this, yeah. I think there's a time and place, and you know, this could be a one-off because we really have only checked out what two, two yeah, so two, far. Yeah, two. This is second uh, full special that we, of yeah. Randy Fellface that we checked out. Yeah, and so this is the first time he's done one of these kind of things. Mm -hmm. You know, like this introspective bring you in. Yeah, but I, I yeah. dig it. I dig it. It's not bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the baby agreed, dude. That was hilarious. Why? <laughs> Why? It was just the quietest audience ever. It's like oh. perfect timing. What oh, the hell? My. It's like senior year of high school. I was doing Lord of the Flies as the high school play, and uh, it was like a very quiet time. I don't know what the scene was, but someone opened a can of soda 
during that time and everyone laughed and everyone on everyone in the cast was like you motherfucker yeah. son of a bitch it's supposed to be impactful and deep and then all of a sudden one can of coke yeah spoils it all <laughs> yeah uh. I wandered directionless through the trees for a few hours, thinking about what it means to belong to a place. This forest is foreign to me, but I'm home here somehow. I actually feel when I'm not at home, which either pro proves that home state of mind, or maybe that I don't really feel like myself where I come from. Mm. I don't know if that's true, actually. I mean, I grew up in country Victoria, but you wouldn't know it, really. I, I don't know what my relationship to country is, you know? I mean, occasionally I give people directions using compass points, if that counts. I hate it when people in the country do that. Right, oh, matey, what you want to do, you just want to head east for about 20 clicks and then take a sow to sow westerly bearing. All right, Galileo. <laughs> Just give me some landmarks and some street names. I'm not taking the King's Road into battle. I'm trying to get to best and less, you dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think, I think Australia is an incredible country, but the overall feel of the place often elicits the same response in me as that seven-year-old boy slow clapping his way into a detention. <laughs> you know, I just, I just want to shake it up a bit. We paint ourselves as lovable larrikins, but we're extremely fucking uptight. I think we repress or reject a lot of the interesting parts of this place. The edge, the friction, the variety, you know? The truths that we're constantly protecting ourselves from. That lucky country bullshit that's built on the misfortune of others. I mean, look who's running the country. It's pretty gross. The entitlement's pretty disgusting. And that's not a political statement, that's just like human observation. <laughs> Yucky poos! You know what I mean? Look, if you don't need to consider any life experience other than what's happening on your own little quarter acre block, or if you can see a doctor whenever you need to see a doctor, and no part of your brain is reserved for processing if you're in danger, or even where you actually fit in a culturally complex system. I don't necessarily begrudge you any of that, but I don't want to hear your opinion on immigration policy. Like, you don't get a seat at the table if you're ambivalent about babies in detention, but have time to openly weep while watching the MasterChef finale. <laughs> <clears throat> I stopped to relieve myself against a small stone wall in the undergrowth and discovered that I'm actually standing on the edge of a swimming pool. <laughs> it's the ruins of a swimming pool. It's full of leaves and fallen branches and shit, but it's unmistakable in its aquatic origins. I look around and slowly it dawns on me that I am standing in the middle of the abandoned ruins of the Cornish estate. Edward Joel Cornish was born in Iowa in 1862. He was practicing law by the age of 21, climbed his way up to assistant district attorney and became the personal lawyer and friend of a man by the name of Levi Carter of the Carter Lead Company. Carter's Leadworks was like the largest manufacturer of paint in the United States. We're talking a good 60 years before people recognised that lead poisoning from paint and airborne particles from leaded petrol causes learning difficulties, aggressive behaviour and a tendency to believe whatever you read on the Facebook. <laughs> When Levi Carter died in 1903, Edward Cornish became the president of the company and married Levi's widow, Selena. As they say in the lead business, you can't cut a dead man's lunch. <laughs> Edward so oh. I'm keeping that fucking line, I don't care what you think. <laughs> Edward so company to National Lead, he bought a bunk of stocks and he ended up serving as president of National Lead for like 17 years. And in that time, he and Selena left the city and they purchased this grand estate in the Hudson Hills. 
They bought it from a Chicago diamond merchant named Sigmund Stern. And I fucking wish I made that detail up because Sigmund Stern, the diamond merchant, sounds like a character from a Scooby-Doo episode. <laughs> oh, well, I'm Sigmund Stern and somebody's been stealing all of my diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> uh. That bit was just for the racist baby. <laughs> Edward and Selina were madly in love. They threw lavish parties in their expansive mansion and they rolled through the roaring 20s in lead-funded style. Then one day in 1938, at the impressive age of 76, Edward Cornish dropped dead at his desk from a heart attack. Over the following two weeks, Selina took care of the arrangements. She made sure Edward had a proper send-off and then she died herself. The mansion and the grounds were passed on to Edward's nephew, Joel, who spent the next 20 years largely ignoring his aunt and uncle's prized legacy until accidentally setting fire to the mansion in 1958 and burning it to the ground. And here I am, 60 years later to the day, standing in the ruins of Edward and Selina's dream home, the charred remains of a shared life. All that was once important to these people, reclaimed by the forest. Good. <laughs> Fuck them! <laughs> Who cares? These are the kind of stories that we give weight and value to. This is the measure of success that we're fed. Every history book in the world tells a version of this fucking fairy tale, but who gives a shit? It's easy to lose perspective when you're swaddled in safe narratives. I bought it. Like, I'm achieving a lifelong dream right now, performing my own comedy show off-Broadway in New York, and it is the worst thing that's happening to me right now. I could not be taking it any more personally. The fucking entitlement of that. That is privilege. Privilege is not an abundance of opportunity, it's an absence of obstacles, right? And the best I can hope for, if I use that privilege for all it's worth, is that one day my legacy will lay in ruins in a forest somewhere and some kid will stumble upon it while pissing on the ashes. <laughs> <laughs> and standing there, I burst into hysterical laughter and I turn around and I start running, crashing my way through the forest back towards the train station, plotting my revenge on the theatre-going crowds of New York City. <laughs> wow, what an epiphany. Hey, man, it, it, it comes to all of us in different ways, you know? Yeah, yeah. Hopefully one day uh, in the Internet archives there will be over... 2500 videos of the two of us looking at content and for someone so i don't know on the blockchain to just piss all yep. over it'll 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 be an ancestor of ours somewhere down the line yeah i yeah. remember that wackadoo ancestor we had back in the day what was his name yeah let's go see what he did back in the day you know and then that's mm -hmm. what they'll find us i'm like what the fuck were they doing <laughs> I can't wait. Yep. I can't wait for that. The rest of the season was just as shit. <laughs> it didn't get any better. They fucking hated me. But my attitude slowly improved, right? And I came back to Australia and I made myself a promise that if I ever got an opportunity like that again, I would get out of my own way. And I didn't have to wait long because 2019 was arguably the best year of my career. I was the most fun, I was the most present, I had a fucking great time. And it started with a magical telephone call. Stand by for a chilling reenactment. <laughs> bring, bring. Uh, bring it to fuck it to bring it to bring. Hello? Hey Randy, it's Hollywood. Oh my God, Hollywood's on the phone. Hi, Hollywood. Hey, Randy, we love what you do. You are funny, and believe us, we know funny. But tell me, Randy, why have you never done a reality television program? 
Oh, come on, Randy. Reality television's not the shame factory it once was. And what is reality if not a commodity? And what is entertainment if not a competition? You listen to me, Hollywood. I am not a shill to be bought and sold like a common Pop-Tart. I say good day to you, Hollywood. We will pay you a wage, cover your airfare, and guarantee you a one-year working visa. Shut up and kiss me, Hollywood. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how it happened. That, my friends, is how I signed on to be a contestant on NBC's feel-good hit of the summer, Bring the Funny, a reality television program in which comedians were competing for 250000 years. US dollars. Spoiler alert! <laughs> I did not win. <laughs> I did have a really nice time though. I met some wonderful people, I told a few jokes, and I made it out of there with my anal virginity largely intact. <laughs> the only time, the only time it got a little bit intense was while we were filming the reality portion of the show. Now, they call the interviews with contestants on these reality shows reality. That's what they call the reality bit, right? All the, all the reality shows have them. You know what I'm talking about? Like, oh, and then I thought, well, this souffle is never going to rise. I just want to make my kids proud. Kelly is such a slut! All that, right? <laughs> they shoot it, they edit it, and they turn the contestants into characters. So you at home can invest in the character and give a shit whether or not they win or lose. Now, everybody on the show gets assigned a story producer. The story producer's job is to make the contestant look interesting, like they've got a compelling backstory. And my story producer fucking hated me. <laughs> because you've seen my backstory, it's not good television, you know? There's no drama. And she snapped. Three weeks in, she just snapped. After me giving her smart-ass responses to every delving question, she just went, ah! Randy, where is the heart? Where is the drama? Where is the hook? And I said, there isn't any. I tell jokes for a living and I sleep like a fucking baby. <laughs> and she snapped in front of the entire crew and grabbed me by the arm and dragged me off set. And everybody went, ooh. <laughs> She pulled me out onto the back lot. We were shooting at Universal Studios in Burbank, in, in California, and she shoved me into a golf buggy, because they all drive around in these little golf carts. She got in and started driving, and I was like, um, where are we going? And she said, shut the fuck up! <laughs> and I went, oh, I'm being fired. Uh. And this icy feeling just settled in my stomach and I started sweating and I started shaking and I was like, oh fuck, I blew it. I just smart-assed my way out of another opportunity. I got here, this is it, they're gonna kick me off the lot, I'm never gonna work in America again, I'm never gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna my name's gonna be dragged through the mud, this gonna, oh my God, look, there's the Jaws ride. <laughs> We went through three security checkpoints and then one massive security checkpoint and we drove out into this giant courtyard surrounded on all four sides with huge concrete walls with murals of movie stars painted on all the walls. Ingrid Bergman, Marceline Day, Audrey Hepburn and Val Kilmer for some reason. <laughs> In the middle of the courtyard there was an enormous swimming pool, a bar with a bartender and she looked at me and said, get the fuck out. So I got out and she just drove off. So I started walking towards this swimming pool where in the middle of the pool there was a huge, fat, bald man with sunglasses floating on an inflatable pink flamingo. <laughs> and as I got to the edge of the pool, he lowered his sunglasses and said, I hear you're having trouble finding a backstory, young man. And I said, yes, sir, I don't really have any drama to draw from. And he said, well, you are contractually obligated to find some drama, young man, so hop to it. He nodded to the bartender. The bartender pressed a button on the bar and suddenly Two doors opened, one at either end of the courtyard, and out of one of them burst Jason Statham, wielding an axe, naked, covered <laughs> in baby oil. He what? just looked at me and said, do whatever it fucking takes. Ah! And I went, ah! and I started running towards the other door, and he was gaining on me, and the man in the pool said, don't come back without a little drama. And I leapt through the door, and it slammed shut behind me, and the axe went, Frrr! into the door 
And then I was plunged into pitch darkness, and I crawled on my hands and knees for what felt like an eternity through spiders and mud and rats and shit until finally I emerged from underneath the Hollywood sign, blinking in the blazing Californian sun. And I started to panic. I was like, oh my God, I need a backstory. I don't have a backstory. My parents are still alive. I was never molested. I don't support the troops. What am I gonna do? And then I noticed that there was like a 5G mobile telephone tower. And I read somewhere that they like kill bees or something. So I was like, oh, maybe that will give me radiation poisoning. That's a good angle. So I started rubbing myself against this tower. And while I was rubbing myself against the tower, I woke up a homeless man who was sleeping at the foot of the tower and I was like, huh, he's bound to have a communicable disease, right? So I started sucking his dick, right? <laughs> so while I was bobbing away, yeah, that, 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 on this homeless man's rancid cock, that, 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 he started to tell me a story. Oh my God. <laughs> he said, you know, <clears throat> I was on season two of America's Got Talent. What they don't tell you when you leave is that you're too famous to go back to your job, but not famous enough to be actually famous, so no one will hire you. Faster. Mm. <laughs> you think you're gonna be the person on reality television that everybody loves, but that's not why we watch. We watch for the failures. We look for the flaws. Deciding winners based on a public voting system has given these morons the illusion of power. They don't know how to handle that power, so they take to Twitter and they say awful things and they ruin the hopes and dreams of people more talented than they will ever be. Oh! <laughs> Oh my God. And I said, You're right, old man. I don't need to change my image to suit the unrealistic expectations of some imaginary audience. I can make it in Hollywood on my own terms. So I turned around and I ran all the way back to the studio and I got there just as they called my name to go out on stage and I went out there and I smashed it. Three and a half minutes of bulletproof comedy gold and the crowd went wild and then I realised I was still in my hotel room and there was definitely weed in that brownie. <laughs> oh no. Brandy, no. Now the whole show makes sense. Oh. It's the ramblings of a full wicked trip. Uh, <laughs> that's why you only eat a corner of the pop oh, brownie. Oh, God. Uh, that makes the whole show make more sense. He's retelling <laughs> a trip he had. Yeah. <laughs> of, uh, uh, the, oh, yeah. That much pot brownie the size of a large book, I'm assuming. Yeah. 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 That'll that'll, that'll make you that'll make it turn eight years old again. Yeah, or suck a homeless guy <laughs> off near Hollywood sign. Oh God. I love that. Uh, I love that. Way man, this man crafts some pretty awesome stories. Yeah. He is yeah, a yeah. master storyteller, to that, say yeah. the least. Yeah, he's an amazing storyteller. <laughs> man. Uh, let's finish this, man. <sighs> Closing song, that's what this is. Start edging towards the exit if you're busting for a piss. Closing song, hold your applause. My contract is in violation of child labour laws. I think I've learned a valuable life lesson. Really? Yep. When you've got it good, you've got to count your fucking blessings. And when you've got it bad, you can just blame your childhood. Nice. Blame your parents, blame religion, blame, blame the, the fact that, that you're misunderstood. In a closing song. A 
closing song. Closing song. In a closing song. A closing song. <laughs> Good night, Australia. <laughs> <laughs> That was awesome. That is amazing. And oh man. Oh man, that was awesome. <laughs> I needed gotta, that, dude. We got to clip something of that and send it to YouTube. Oh man, we got to try. Okay. Just so he can refer to it in his next comedy special. These two American bastards stealing my content and building an audience wrong uh, of it. What uh, two pieces of shit. Yep. And it'll be made funnier because it's I got like that. Yeah. I, absolutely love this guy what he's doing man it's it's just so different it's so refreshing because it's yeah. not like a um dunham it's not right. a ventriloquist act i guess you could say it but you're not seeing the guy so it's right. different i like this yeah. a lot man ah oh, man he has a lot of staying power and i hope he keeps continuing on oh, like yeah. that yep i can't wait to see him next month dude he's me neither oh, man. anyway Thanks for watching. What what should they do now, Dan? Probably unplug and 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 do something legendary, guys. I agree. We'll see y'all next time. Later, guys. Fellas, we could be that mistake. Let's do this. <laughs>